to be here to be part of this has changed my life forever and I'm just so honored and, and grateful and humble and proud and excited to be here and sad that it's ending in a way today and yet it, what's great is that it will it'll live forever. I believe in the power of the message and it will make a difference. If one person, if one veteran is helped by this message, then we've all done our job. It was a, uh, obviously the worst, but it was also the best experience I've ever had. I heard a phrase years ago, and I believe in it. If we had a war, if there was a war, wouldn't it be great if no one came? Memorial Day is a very, very important date because we remember those that didn't make it back primarily from uh, the war and that we honor their memories. My hope in doing this film, number one, It's for the vets who have had these experiences, whether it's World War I, II, Korea, Vietnam, Persian Gulf, whatever. They know there's someone out there who cares about them. They understand what's going on. They know they're not alone. And secondly, My kids and my grandkids won't go through this shit. If we can come close to even having a whisper of that, I'll be more than pleased. I, I guess if you make the argument that we're fighting for freedom uh, here in America and abroad, then all wars are good wars. That's what they told us. In fact, my father was a, I was saying to someone, I'm a, I'm a product of a military family. So my father had been a, Na a Navy man in World War II, and my uh, father-in-law was a Tuskegee Airman. So for me, and I had uncles in the military, so there's no real trauma going in the military. It was a rites of passage. Whereas a young man goes in the service, uh, he's just a kid, and he comes out a man. The Corregidor was taken back by flushing it with oil and using flamethrowers on the oil. So that anybody who were in the tunnels would destroy the enemy. And uh, I have to say, I went in, I saw a helmet, and I picked it up, never realizing there was a head there. Well, I was telling a story that I had never understood what the concept of power was all about as a black man in America. Because I'm not supposed to know much about that. Uh, uh, I was so aware of it in the Nam, because I carried three weapons, an M60, a 16, and a 38. Nobody would dare fuck with me about anything. So as a result, I had a good time, because I didn't have to talk much. You follow what I'm saying? Uh, I didn't understand until much later, I was in college or someplace, that I was probably one of the first of a generation of soldiers who were black who were allowed to carry weapons. We were uh, in some narrow squeaks and situations where we, where we got out, and uh, some of it was uh, close combat. Some of them, we never saw who, who we were shooting at anyway. My roommate got killed over there. That was a, uh, that's probably my toughest moment uh, when I found out that he died. And he and I flew together a lot, and uh, we're just like brothers. And he's a good guy, and, uh, you know. I was off working as a forward air controller when, uh, when he got shot down. 
really, really hurt. The other crew in our barracks, they, they went down. So, and you really feel crappy. What makes you feel wor worse is when the guys come in to take their personal belongings, pack them up, take them out, and then within the next few days, they'll get a new crew in there. And uh, you really, after outside of your own crew, you didn't really get too close to too many people because you develop a friendship, all of a sudden they're gone. Anybody that says they weren't scared, well, it's uh, crazy. It was like a continuing process of fear. Um, I was not involved in combat. I worked with the refugees primarily, but one day I went to a ville beforehand. There was still smoking from the VC had been there the night before, and I, when I asked the people where, where were the bad guys, they said down at the tree line. And the next day, a Marine Corps guy, former Marine Corps guy who had been working with, similar to what I did, when he got off active duty, he volunteered to return to Vietnam as a civilian working with the refugees. And he got out of his, his Jeep and stepped on a landmine and was blown up. So it was, you know, I was always aware of that. You see people get, I saw a lot of Vietnamese killed. I was also a survivor assistance officer when I came back to the States working with military dead. It's a scary, pretty scary situation. Starts your adrenaline going real good. I always say if it was a million dollar experience, you wouldn't get two cents to do again. I guess that's the trials and tribulations of war. Some are lucky, some are not. When I was over there, when I would hear talk about people who, who were criticizing the war, I just thought they were cowards, making up excuses not to be here. That's what I thought it was. As a matter of fact, they were even running out of the country, running across the border. That's what cowards do. And then, of course, eventually they were allowed back to walk alongside me and my brothers. Do you realize how unfair that was? The very nature of it. The guys go put themselves on the line. The other guys run off. But they're allowed to be forgiven. And guess what? They're still talking bad about you. We need to examine those issues. We need to take a hard look at that. It's not right. You know, it was a stupid war. Like everybody, I think everybody knows all war is stupid. But, uh... The United States has always prospered in war. And uh, at least in my way of thinking, war is ill. It's, it's not the, but we had to serve our country. I spent my five years of my youth plus reserve time, and I felt I'd given up an awful lot. Four of my friends were killed. And uh, so to me, war accomplishes nothing. And uh, I hope that the time will come that the politics won't account for anything either. I sure as hell think there's a bad war. And the bad war is when the politicians get in there, like uh, politicians did in Korea. The politicians sure as hell did in Vietnam. And the military couldn't do their job. Oh, Memorial Day is great because it brings back some of the memories. You remember some of the guys you uh, flew with, and uh, you remember the times, of course, in battle. And uh, it actually almost seems like a dream when you, during the year, but Memorial Day, all the gates open up and uh, you start remembering those things. In 1983, when my daughter was fell and hit her head, and I was running around trying to find a doctor, and while running, it, it flashed on me how 13 years before I was doing the same thing for some Vietnamese kids. And uh, none of them survived. My daughter did. Take 
a moment to appreciate what different people have done for us uh, throughout the various conflicts and uh, the sacrifices that they made, the sacrifices that their families made. And uh, make sure that these things are passed on to younger people. But I think wars are inevitable. I think war is an absolutely inevitable thing, has been since the get-go, and B.C. forward. Uh, as long as people are jealous, as long as people are envious, as long as people uh, are bullies, uh, you're going to have war. When you come out here, you realize the horror of it when you see 85,000 people that probably died anywhere from 18 on up. And uh, no one will ever convince me that there was a good reason. No one who's been in war likes war. It's a horrible thing. Unfortunately, there are times you have to do it. That's, I don't have an answer for that. And that bothers me. War is not a pleasant thing. But we had to fight for our country so that our kids would be free. I mean, I, well, I fought for that American flag. When I stand up and, and salute that flag, I'm proud because I fought for this country. And nobody could call me a coward as I went in the service when they needed me. And I feel good about it. These guys, 85,000 guys, stand at duty every day. So I'm just, um, I was lucky to be allowed in and uh, serve and still do. And it means that uh, I've probably been uh, privileged to be a member of the greatest fraternity that's ever lived. If something like that occurred again, I would certainly hope, even though I, I abhorred war, that it's necessary that my grandchildren would also serve their country. But if you have to be in the war, do the best you can. Do whatever basically is asked of you to do. And, uh, mm, that's about it. Aftermath, March 1919. 19. Siegfried Sassoon, have you forgotten yet? Look down and swear by the slain of the war that you'll never forget. Do you, Do you remember, remember the dark months you held the sector at Mehmet's? The nights you watched and wired and dug and piled sandbags on parapets? Do you remember the rats and the stench of corpses rotting front of the front line trench and dawn coming dirty white and chill with a hopeless rain? Do you, you ever stop, stop and ask, is it all going to happen again? Do you remember with that hour of din before the attack and the anger, the blind compassion that seized and shook you then as you peered at the doomed and haggard faces of your men? Do you remember, remember the, the stretch of cases lurching back, the dying eyes and the falling heads, those ashen gray, masks of the lads who once were keen and kind and gay? Have you forgotten it? Look up and swear by the green of spring 